Shane, a couple weeks ago, you were here talking about the T formation. This week, it's the diamond formation. Let's start with this. What exactly does the diamond formation look like? As I talked about in the article a little bit, similar to the T formation, it is completely symmetrical. If you were to draw a line down the middle of the center going through the quarterback, uh, there's equal players on both sides. Where it differs from the T is that it's a little more spread out. So the quarterback's in the pistol or the shotgun, which means he's not under center and he has to catch a snap. He's going to have two H-backs or tight ends, whatever you want to call them, behind the guards uh, or in that area to his sidecar position. Um, and then he has a tailback behind him and two receivers out wide. I found it interesting, your description. Mike Yursich did use this formation when he was at Oklahoma State, but he had very different personnel there at Oklahoma State than what he has at Penn State. 100%. So when he was at Oklahoma State, uh, they used this thing called a cowboy back, um, which a lot of people describe them as just human battering rams. Um, they were often like converted defensive linemen, um, like guys 280 plus pounds. They basically just throw them in a 40, uh, you know, 42, 43, whatever 40 number they had available and tell them to go knock someone's head off, you know, with the ISO block. Um, obviously, the personnel is a little bit different at Penn State. Um, they have more versatile tight ends that are used more so in the receiving game, um, but they can also, you know, catch passes uh, and perform all different kinds of blocks, which I'm sure we'll get into. But in the 22 season, what we typically saw were the two tight ends next to Sean Clifford, the running back behind him. What were the basic plays that they would run out of this formation, Shane? Yeah, so I think the beauty of, of what Coach Jersitz does um, is he's able to run his core concepts from a number of different formations. So they didn't run a whole lot of different plays, uh, per se, from this formation. They ran you know, their inside zone run, inside zone split, meaning they're going to leave a defensive end unblocked and they're going to use one of the H-backs to kick that guy out coming across the formation. And then they ran a lot of their counter play, which is where the guard's going to pull and kick out the defensive end, and then the, one of the H-backs will uh, wrap through and lead block for the running back. You also talked about the the RPO that they would run out of this, where obviously run-pass option is what RPO stands for, and there's always one player that the quarterback reads on an RPO. Who does he read on that play, and how does he make the decision? Right. So a lot of times when you get into these heavy sets like this, uh, where you have you know, two tight ends on the field or two fullbacks, um, you're going to get single high defenses. Now, this didn't happen all the time, but what that means is that there's a post safety, which means he's in the middle of the field uh, playing the post. And that then allows the defense to bring uh, one of their defensive backs now into the box uh, to help stop against the run. So that player is often referred to as the conflict defender, meaning we don't have enough guys in the, the run blocking unit to account for him. So, you know, if we're running just an inside zone play um, in the diamond, we would have seven potential blockers, um, whereas uh, the defense would have eight guys being able to make the play. So what we do is we just RPO that guy, meaning if he wants to play the run, we'll throw a slant or a glance right behind his eardrum. Um, and then if he wants to drop back, we can always hand it off. You also mentioned in your article, this I found interesting, that on the RPO play, it appeared that Sean Clifford pretty much made the re correct read every single time where there were opportunities on the zone read running play where Sean Clifford probably could have kept the ball and run, but he gave up that opportunity. And I was interested to read that because it did seem this past season that Sean Clifford overall was kind of reluctant to pull the ball and run it himself. I think at the end of the day, he's looking at, uh, you know, who would we rather have carrying the football? Um, and, you know, where a lot of times in, in the RPO world, in the read world, your reads are going to get muddy, meaning the, the defensive end will try to do like a surf technique, meaning he's going to stick his arms out and try to play both of you. Um, and, you know, when it gets muddy like that, I think the safe play is just to hand it off and, and let your, your five-star running backs handle that. Um, you know, I, and also in Coach Yersich's offense, you don't want your quarterback taking a whole lot of hits. Uh, he's never really had like a true dual, a true dual threat. Um, so, you know, I'm sure you know in the in the quarterback room, the coaching point is that if it's muddy, just give it, um, and we'll live to fight another down. 
when in doubt, yes, I think you'd rather have the running back take it. I also was intrigued when you gave one example where Drew Aller, in the same kind of situation, he didn't seem to hesitate to keep the ball himself. Yeah, hopefully we don't see too much of that next year. I think we want to keep him as healthy as possible. But when the game's on the line, you know, sometimes your quarterback's got to take uh, got to take control. And as big as he is, he doesn't seem afraid to do that. Whenever you have these kind of formations, and we saw this a couple of weeks ago when we talked T formation, is Mike Yursich seems to develop this as the season goes on, and we start to see more options out of it. And you pointed this out that it started with the tight ends on either side of the quarterback, Sean Clifford, with the running back behind him. But that started to change a bit where we'd end up with the running back at the sidecar position where the tight ends were, and they could do a few different things out of that. If you're the defense, you start to think, all right, this is a running formation. The tight ends will lead the way, the running back behind them. But because of Penn State's talent at tight end, all of a sudden there's play action and you're now throwing the ball to the tight ends. Um, I think it opens up a a large book of possibilities. Um, I know at Oklahoma State, uh, Coach Jershitz had receivers that, you know, their specialty was winning one-on-one balls. Um, and they also had a quarterback in Mason Rudolph whose specialty was throwing the deep ball. So, you know, how, how we talked about earlier, how you might get a lot of single high coverage from this formation, that then creates one-on-ones on the perimeter. So obviously Clifford's strength wasn't in throwing the ball down the field, throwing it 50 yards on a post or a go. And we also didn't have receivers whose specialty was, you know, winning and stacking uh, defensive backs down the field. Um, we obviously have some new personnel coming in this year. Uh, and I don't know if Dante Cephas is official yet. But when he is, you know, he's a guy that can make those plays down the field. And now everyone knows about the new quarterback we have, whose specialty is letting it fly. So I think it will be interesting to see how the the vertical pass game evolves. 